All right, uh, we'll get started. Um, I'm gonna kick us off. Welcome everyone to the Behavioral Science Author Series uh, brought to you by the Behavior Change for Good Initiative here at the University of Pennsylvania. I am Angela Duckworth. I'm a professor here at Wharton and also in psychology. I'm the co-director of Behavior Change for Good, uh, which we affectionately call BCFG. Uh, I'm joined by Katie Milkman, a fellow professor here at Wharton. Uh, and uh, we are both thrilled to have uh, three amazing uh, friends uh, and thought leaders. Uh, we have Professor Nina Majar of Boston University, Professor Dilip Soman of the University of Toronto. Um, they're here to discuss their new book, uh, Behavioral Science in the Wild. Uh, it looks like this. Um, it'll be a little bigger than this, but it looks mostly like this. Um, this is the beautiful cover. Um, and uh, they're going to be in discussion and conversation with Michael Hallsworth, uh, Managing Director of the Behavioral Insights Team, BIT North America. Um, so thank you, Michael, for leading today's conversation with our two amazing authors, uh, Nina and Dilip. Thank you for joining us. Uh, to our audience, as a reminder, and especially if this is your first uh, BCFG uh, book seminar, uh, please, at any point, put your questions in the Q&A uh, so that um, there is you know, a chance for those to make it into uh, the conversation. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Michael. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Angela. It's great to be with you all today. So behavioral science in the wild. Um, I'd like to start with a question for Nina. Um, this book, if you read it, it becomes quickly apparent that it's got a slightly different tone from many of the books you read on behavioral science. It's more cautious and sometimes cautionary um, than cheerleading, I suppose. So why yep. is that? What motivated you to, to take that approach? Where are you coming from with this? You know, um, I mean, we had all these amazing books out there, right, that, that, that have really shown how how amazing the effects can be when you apply behavioral science and they have been all very positive. And, and, and I think the problem there is that I think to some extent, this has created the, the impression that applying behavioral science is really easy and that whenever you apply that you will get these huge effects. And I don't think that that has been very useful for practitioners as they are trying to really apply those insights that we have been creating, applying that to their real world problems and finding out, oh, wait a second, so somehow this isn't that easy and it doesn't work out as it has been shown in the paper and somehow the effect is, is not that large. And, and, and what we have been seeing, I think, is among some of the of the organizations that have been applying behavioral science, that then some of the reactions have been rather, well, maybe behavioral science doesn't work in general. Maybe we should just not be using it as a tool. And, and so we thought it is important to maybe have a book almost at the other end of the spectrum to put to, to inject a little bit more of the reality and 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 first of all help organizations recalibrate what they can expect, but also actually help them through that journey on how to apply it really in a way that will lead to hopefully better results because it is not that trivial. There are a lot of things that are oftentimes not necessarily mentioned in the paper when academics write a paper for an academic audience, but important aspects that, that practitioners should know. And, 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 and this is where the idea came from, but, but I'm sure that Dilip can actually say much more because he was actually really the, 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 the one here on this team who, who had the initial idea for the book. And, and when he suggested it to me, I was like, yeah, I actually do think that would be very useful for practitioners. So. Dilip, what would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll add a couple of things. Uh, so uh, Angela started off by introducing us as authors, and we are, but it's actually an edited book. And, and this was a conscious choice. I mean, you know, Nina and I could have written this, uh, but we felt who better than, for example, Katie Milkman to talk about the nuances in the fresh start effect, and who better than Christina Bicelli to talk about norm nudging and so on and so forth. So we did work with a large team of people to put this together. So that's the one thing I just wanted to, uh, to flag. Uh, the second thing, I think, uh, Michael, it's consistent with uh, what you and Elspeth write about in your book. I think the notion that a field since 2008 has come a long way, I think, 
you know, our, our first challenge as a field was to establish relevance. I think we've done that. I think there's no debate nowadays when we go into governments or, or uh, for-profit organizations that this stuff is useful. I think the debate now is how uh, and for what and when does it work and when it doesn't. And, and as Nina said, I think oftentimes we do end up in situations where we overpromise, and not because it's done deliberately, but uh, people read a subset of the of the research and they have high expectations. So I do think it's time we look back and add a little bit more nuance uh, to our field. And I think that was the goal here. Yeah, I, have, I would say favorite, but I'm not sure favorite is the right word. But there's some really nice uh, examples that remain in your mind about you know studies that haven't really panned out as as intended or as in the original study, what are the ones that really kind of brought it home to you? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here and I, uh, I'm sure Nina has a few that she can add to, but I, I think the there's a lot of examples. And I think the one that I want to actually highlight is a chapter that Indranil Goswami and Oleg Orminsky wrote. And uh, they did a wonderful job in trying to reconcile studies that work with studies that don't and why that happens. And so in that chapter, they sort of have this notion of uh, the, the idea that every intervention causes multiple potentially conflicting consequences. So for example, let's look at norm nudging, right? So uh, we can tell people 70% of people uh, do whatever it is that you want them to do. Uh, so obviously the, the famous trial that started it all, the BIT, you know, uh, getting people to pay taxes on time was one of, one of those classic examples. Uh, but I, as a consumer, can look at the 70% and have one of two reactions. One reaction is, wow, a lot of people are doing it, uh, and so I should. But I could equally well say, gosh, 30% of people aren't doing it, so it's okay. Uh, and, and so sometimes you get these conflicting things, and I think it's really the context, the, the way in which that intervention is delivered that can actually switch one of these consequences with the other one. One other quick example, and then I'll turn it over to Nina. Um, I did a lot of research early on in the lab in sort of small controlled pilots showing A, that people overspend when they use credit cards compared to cash. We've known this for a while. Um, but we showed that if you give people a, you know, a feedback on how much they've spent, that overspending reduces, right? So just reminding people, hang on, you've spent X dollars so far, right? Um, so, so that works wonderfully well. Uh, the, the experiments we did involve giving people that feedback on the same screen in which they made the purchasing decision. So you tap, tap the card, you've got a running total of how much you've spent, works really well. Um, when you take this to a larger scaled version, so we have data from South Korea, uh, where we look at text alerts, which remind people how much they have spent. Uh, and it turns out, you know, on an average, the effect backfires when you send people text alerts on an average, people are spending more. Uh, and that's interesting, but then you start looking at the heterogeneity within. And it turns out for about 15 to 16% of the population, it actually works. Uh, the heavy spenders actually spend less when you remind them how much they spend. It's everybody else that spends a bit more, right? And again, what's going on here is something very simple is that uh, for people who are not that engaged in the mental accounting process, the knowledge that their phone is keeping track of their expenses makes them even less engaged. We expected that you know, the, the text messaging would actually help them account better. Uh, we get the opposite effect. So again, I think that these subtle changes uh, in the way in which interventions are delivered uh, in the lab uh, versus in the field have massive differences in terms of the outcomes. And I think we need to be very sensitive to that. I don't know, Nina, if you have a favorite example to add. I didn't actually want to add an example because I think those are actually very nice that you mentioned, but I, I wanted to build on that and, and say that I think this is really one of the good things about the, the, the book that we are, that was edited, because I think almost every chapter actually really also talks about how it's important to realize when we scale um, insights from, from the lab to the field, there is this aspect of heterogeneity that oftentimes academic papers haven't really dived into, right? That's, that's oftentimes, oftentimes a function of the samples that we're using, that they are not as heterogeneous to begin with, but as you scale something in the field and to a larger population, there is just much more variety in the types of people. Um, but it, it, it's also a, a function very often, at least in the past, when we think of the academic papers, that 
especially when it comes to lab experiments, they're just not that large. So we don't have the power, the sample size to really look at, okay, well, are there different types of people that are reacting differently? And, 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 and I think several of those chapters, whether they are talking about financial decision-making or how to improve health or, or whatever, they, they also touch upon that. And I think that by itself is a really important insights for practitioners to have. You mentioned the, the tax example that I, I did in the UK and what people need to remember about that as well is that that is a sample, of, it's a very large sample, but it's people who are already late. And that's a subset. And so the concept may not work exactly the same for people who have generally um, paid the tax in time. Um, Nina, there's a there's a phrase in, in the book uh, that leaps out called the nudge store approach, which got my attention. Would you mind just explaining what that is and, and some of the, the dangers of the nudge store? So that I will actually pass on to Dylan because I think it's actually in his chapter where, where, where he and I believe Tangent are and, and Laura are talking about the nudge stores. So Dylan. Yeah, so, so, so we did a fair bit of work sort of pre-setting up this book and its framework where we talked to managers and people in behavioral units, uh, trying to understand how they actually took interventions from published research and applied them. And we went in with a blank slate. Um, uh, you know, we had a bunch of research assistants interviewing people saying, well, how do you actually embed the research in the work you do, right? And, and it turns out uh, one of the most popular approaches is, is what we call the nut store approach. The idea that people will look at a research paper uh, they will form some sort of semblance of similarity between the problem being covered in that paper versus the problem that they're looking to solve. And if they feel the domain is similar enough, they will essentially replicate what's done in the paper, right? Um, and we think that's problematic for obvious reasons. I think the biggest reason is we know our field uh, has told us time and again that everything is context dependent. We know that it matters who your participants are. Um, and so I, I guess the way I would put it is that, you know, just because the BIT found an effect that worked really well in the UK back in 2010 is zero guarantee that it's going to work in Canada uh, in 2022. Uh, and, and so I think it's really important for us to, I, I guess, you know, uh, to discourage practitioners from simply not shopping, right? It's not about just going to the store and saying, oh, look, uh, these guys changed the framing and they got like whopping effects. And so we should do the same. I think as Nina said earlier, uh, most of those uh, nut store experiences end up in failure and uh, that's not good for the science. That's not good for you know fostering trust in, in the work we do. So, uh, so that's essentially what we meant by uh, the nut store approach to borrowing interventions. We think there's a much better way in which people should be uh, translating the research. Okay, so what should we do instead? Uh, Nina, I don't know if you can go through some of the potential ways forward. If, if we're not doing the nudge store approach, what should we do instead to get better results here? I can, I, I can start, uh, I, can, uh, I, I think there's things that practitioners can do differently. There's things that researchers can do differently. So one of the things that researchers don't do very well, and that's because we don't have the incentive to do it, our journals don't have the incentive to make us do it, uh, is to report on the situational factors under which our studies were conducted. So Michael, just as you said, most of, most of the people don't know what the sample was in that famous UK tax trial. Um, you know, it's the same thing with all of our published work is a lot of people don't really know under what context the data were collected and who the participants were. And I think we can do a much better job of simply sensitizing to sensitizing people to, to that. Um, in the field of medicine, we have something called an implementation science. We don't have that in the social sciences, right? It's a, it's a field that talks about how do I take research from the labs and make it applicable to the field. And I wish we had a bit more of that. You know, there's clearly a lot more work to be done uh, in that dimension. But as researchers, I think we, we can do a lot better in terms of standardized reporting and making sure we highlight who our participants were and who they were not, uh, when, our, when our results are applicable and when they're not. And, and I, you know, we, we, I wish we did uh, more of that. Uh, and then in terms of practitioners, uh, I guess one of the key things is to develop this culture of testing in situ, in the context in which you're going to 
uh, apply that intervention. I guess Ronald Reagan always said, trust but verify. Uh, and I think that's the motto I keep using is, you know, papers that are published in our journals aren't false, but they're probably true under a certain set of conditions. So I think they're great to use as hypotheses, as starting points to develop interventions. But I think it's really important to build that culture of testing. Uh, and that requires organizations to cut down the cost of collecting data. So I think that's where we need to push the field towards. I don't know, Nina, if you have anything to add. Yeah, I would, I would, I would maybe just add also a bit more. I think it's, I think it's important that, that even though these are, even though this book is meant for practitioners, right? They're not scientists, um, but to, to start thinking a little bit more about what are the under, like, what are you believing? Like, why are people behaving so ways? Like, what are the underlying mechanisms? And, and, and I think this is where also academia can do much, much better. So most of our papers are, at this point are still relatively effect driven. And that makes it so appealing to then just you, to use that nut store, right? But, but if you really dig deeper and, 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 and as, as, as scientists maybe point out Bit more like what are the underlying conditions necessary to work like what are the underlying also mechanisms um psychological mechanisms of why maybe a, a social norm interventions worked in one setting once you understand that then you may realize even though this um the setting where i want to translate social norms into seems very similar to a different experiment maybe the psychological reason why people may be acting is actually very different and so this could not, and, 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 and so potentially this is not the right intervention for my setting where I want to translate that research to. So this kind of sensitivity, I think, is also something that 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 at least some of the authors in, in, in our book have, has been really trying to, to bring out. Thank you. Um, so, so Dilip, um, I, I completely get the need for kind of caution and um, to tailor you the approach and you say a lot rather, rather than off the peg nudge store should tailor an, a solution. A lot of the time over the last 10 years we've tried to create these kind of accessible frameworks easy to remember that at least improve the base level of people's understanding when when they're say formulating policy. What, how do you think that fits in? Should we continue to push those? How do we get caveats across if we're trying to even communicate some basic principles. What what role is there for popularization if we have all these these caveats as well? Yeah, this is actually a great question. I've thought a lot about this. In fact, I wrote a short piece about this uh, a few years back. I think frameworks are amazing. They have a role to play, but they aren't everything. And I think it's really important for all of us to recognize that, be it the East or simpler or whatever else you could think about, right? Uh, they, they draw people into the field, they allow you to, to work on sort of what I'd call strike rich problems, problems that are not that different across contexts and really simple ones, right? Um, it, it allows people to get the feet wet. Uh, but I think at some point in time, we have to make sure that people believe that that isn't the science. That's a heuristic to help with the science. Uh, but once they get that, uh, then I think it's important to start pushing the frameworks around and say, well, does East always work? Are there situations where uh, it's not a great thing? So again, I'll give an example from some of my research. It's all, also in the book where uh, we were doing this project uh, with Ideas 42 and, and uh, the Pension Authority in Mexico, where we were trying to get people to contribute more to voluntary uh, to, the, to the pension funds. Um, and the oldest you know, uh, trick in the hat is simplifying and making information more engaging and accessible. So we did that with the quarterly statement. Uh, and it turns out on an average, we get a slightly positive, a small increase in voluntary contributions, but heterogeneity kicks in again. For about half the people, we get big increases in voluntary contributions. For the other half, we actually get decreases. And so, of course, you know, we sort of were expecting this when I tell you why, why this was going on. Uh, there's something unique to Mexico, which is Mexico requires every fund to disclose the performance of that fund relative to the other funds, right? And so at any given point in time, about half the funds are going to be better than average and the other half are going to be worse than average. Now, turns out when you make the information easier to process, more people look at this table of 
fund performance. For about half of them, they're saying, well, you know, this is an important problem. Uh, my fund is doing well. They put, they make more contributions. For the other half, they say, well, this is an important thing to do. Gosh, my fund isn't doing well. Uh, I'd rather put the money somewhere else, right? And, and so I think these are the kinds of nuances that are lost by, by simply using a framework like ease, where you say S was simpler, make it simpler. Well, this, we did make it simpler, but you know, it works for half of them and the other. So back to the point, I mean, I think frameworks are great. They have a role to play, uh, but I think we have to move on from the frameworks at some point in time. And so I think just recognizing what the journey looks like for an organization, I think is important, right? Uh, having a framework is better than having nothing at all. Uh, but once an organization gets familiar with the framework, then I think it's time to move on. Yeah, and, and if, if I may add to that, I don't think we are claiming that the book that 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 is that we have co-edited that that is solving like that, that that it has the solution, but rather it it it's it's it, its main aim or two aims is really to create that sensitivity, that awareness that things are not that straightforward, that clear, that easy, that they are more complex, that they are more messy, so that, that organizations have also set the right expectations. Um, and 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 the second is that's why we invited really the uh, all kinds of experts in their fields right so, so we have a chapter on as Dilip said on the fresh start effect co-written by by uh, Katie we have a chapter by Christina Bucchieri on the norm nudging we have a chapter that is just focusing on sustainability another on financial decision making on healthcare where we have experts at least summarize still on a relatively superficial scale, but at least summarize a bit of the nuances of what we know, because clearly we can't expect that practitioners now, now go in and read like a hundred different academic papers, right? But we have these experts to point out at least some of those really important nuances or some of those situations that um, you may want to try to have in place so that the, li that the likelihood of success is higher or that you're decreasing at least the chance of a failure. That is really the purpose of the book. Great summary. Thank you so much, both of you. I'm going to go to questions from the audience because there are a lot and they're good. I'm going to start with a punchy one, uh, which I like here, which is, should we really call behavioral science a science, considering that most of the principles formulated under this area are subjective and may not hold truth in all circumstances? And if I might be permitted maybe to expand on this a bit, it strikes me that you could go down a path of saying, we just have to work out all the heterogeneity and we'll have a better science. Or you could go down the path of saying, this is more of a craft almost, that is focused on context and design and working through those issues. Um, so Dylan, do you wanna kick off with a response to that one? Sure. So. Um... It is a science. I mean, behavioral science is a science. I think there's two aspects to it. There is the method. So there's a scientific method that you need to use to solve problems. But let's keep that aside for a moment. I want to focus a little bit on, uh, you know, a science that a lot of people will argue, will not even argue is a science. Let's look at physics, right? Uh, let's look at the law of gravity. The law of gravity basically makes some very simple predictions. Like if I hold an object up, like this pen here, and I released it uh, and I asked people, what would you predict would happen? I think everybody in this room would predict that the pen would fall down, right? It's, uh, it's clear, it doesn't matter whether it's morning or evening. Uh, my ethnicity doesn't matter, my language doesn't matter, uh, color of the pen, not, nothing matters, right? Um, now, e even with physics though, if, if you didn't know I was on planet Earth and I was on the moon, for example, the pen would have floated away, right? Uh, and so the point I wanna make is that I, I think every science has a bracket a set of background variables under which those predictions hold. Our brackets just happen to be very narrow, right? So it is still scientific, um, but our, our uh, findings are all contingent on a very large number of variables, like you know, R Richard in his book, Misbehaving, called them SIFs. It's supposedly irrelevant. Like who would have thought that the ethnicity of the person matters, but guess it does. Uh, or who would have thought whether it's a weekend or weekday matters, but it does. And so I think we just have narrower context of bracket that we need to deal with. And, and I think that's really why I keep saying uh, it's great to use published research as a hypothesis, as a starting point. Uh, 
And I think it's really important that we develop a set of tools to help practitioners understand how their context is different uh, from what was done in the studies. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's science. We use the same methods. We have hypotheses, we test them, we experiment, we uh, update our beliefs. Uh, so, um, you know, obviously a whole lot of creativity does go into designing interventions, but we test them scientifically. Yeah, do you want to build on any of that? Nothing else to add. It. I thought it was a very nice response. <laughs> I learned some. I agree. Um, so question from Mikhail. Should the field be looking more at individual differences, e.g. culture, gender, etc., to better understand why some interventions and studies work while others do not? Nia, yeah, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I, I, I definitely do think that that is important. And I do think the field is going in that direction, right? But it is going back to what I said earlier, it's really a function of um, do you have the sample size? Let's just start with something as big, right? And, 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 and oftentimes, at least when we think of the lab studies, they usually aren't that big that we can really dig deeper to see like where are the differences does that does it matter what the gender is does it matter what the education level is does it matter what the um the cultural background of a person is or or i mean you name it but but i think the newest studies like if i'm just thinking also of of the one of the bcfg studies right on 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 vaccinations with Walmart, right? Where you have 680,000 people, right? I mean, these are now really experiments where, where you can dig deeper and where you can learn to what extent does heterogeneity, heterogeneity matter? And are there certain um, interventions that work better for certain people or not? So I do think it is important, particular as we're thinking of scaling Right? Because this is when you really have the heterogeneity. So you want to know what kind of differences to expect in reactions to interventions. And, 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 and I do think it is really wonderful that there are now more also academic papers that, that start looking into that so that we can give some guidance to practitioners. But, but um, it's certainly something that I, that I do think where more work needs to be done, but things are happening and that is exciting. And then you can use machine learning and, 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 and all kinds of methods to really dig deeper and even find maybe relationships that you haven't really thought about before. Yeah, if I can build on that last point, I, I think that's critically important. I think machine learning, especially clustering algorithms now give us tools that we didn't have earlier. So if I go back to individual differences and I believe that my effect is a function of gender and age and income and whatever else, right? My traditional approach, I would create like, I don't know, five levels of age and two multiple genders and multiple income categories. And before I knew it, I'd have an experimental design that had like, I don't know, five by two by five, like a lot of conditions, right? And it gets completely intractable. Uh, with machine learning, you don't need to do that. You can actually try a whole bunch of interventions with a population, use some sort of clustering algorithm like causal forests, causal trees to create clusters and then ex post figure out what was common across clusters, whether intervention worked or not. So I think that's one thing that we really need to exploit a lot more of uh, to the behavioral scientists in the room. Uh, methods, I think we have to go and learn new methods. I think there's just a lot more now at our disposal than, uh, than we started this field, uh, the applied field, even you know, short 16 years ago. There's, there's been just so much more that we can do. Thank you. And I don't know the Question from Melissa here. So it says, are there ways to shrink testing to make it easier and more attractive for non-scientists? And I believe you, you Dilip, have talked about this bit in um, your behavioral informed organization, but, but I, maybe you, Dilip, and then Nina could just sure. give some brief ideas on how to pitch testing to make it more attractive to, uh, to non-scientists. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the trick really is this construct that we call the cost of experimentation, right? And I think it's kind of like, it's like Econ 101, right? If you make something cheap, the demand for the thing will go up uh, and the demand for its substitutes will go down. So uh, if you make experimentation cheap, 
then I think it will naturally lead to a greater demand for people wanting to collect data. Uh, but right now it's not cheap. And I don't mean the cost of just collecting and analyzing data. I mean a lot of other stuff, institutional cost, organizational barriers, getting approvals to to do a trial, right? Uh, there are just so many frictions. And then of course, you know, David Halpern keeps talking about the humility aspect, right? A lot of people are resistant to experiment because what if I collect data and learn that the, I don't know, the advertising strategy I was using all along for the past 15 years was not the most optimal one, right? So let's not test and, and let's just not find out. Um, but I think we really need to work on that. There's, there's ways in which we can do this. So I, I think uh, one of the initiatives that our center has started is to build a digital lab where any of our partner organizations could come in and say, look, I just want to, like, I have these two ideas that I want to test uh, and could you help us test them? And so we can build a panel and, collect some data and give some feedback. But I think we really need to make it easy for organizations to collect some data rather than have a lot of armchair theorists sitting around in a, in a boardroom discussing, I don't know whether they should have a, a new ad campaign or offer a discount instead. Uh, but yeah, th th that's sort of my, my top line thing. I don't know, Nina, if you want to add further to that. Um, anything substantial to, to add other than that seems to be really a big part of the first book that Bear um, uh, published last year or two years ago, like with the pandemic, everything seems to be more unclear about timeline. But, but, but that was all about that, like how to really um, prepare an organization to, to be more accepting of experiments and be able to run experiments, right? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I'm sorry, uh, but just to add one more thought, I initially when I started this whole journey, I, I, you know, I had this sort of naive notion that maybe we can help companies become scientific. Uh, and I very quickly realized that that's not going to happen for various reasons, right? Uh, again, it's really the organizational frictions that make it difficult, right? And universities are built for doing research, companies are not. And, and so I think we really need to think of good partnership models going forward. Uh, can academia reduce the cost of experimentation for companies? And then can companies then think about sort of supplying the right kind of problems for academia to study? And I think that's the right way forward. Thank you. So question from Heidi. Nina, I wonder if you could take this one. Um, are the implications that applying behavioral science should always be paired with testing to learn about success and impact in each context? Or are there ways to develop frameworks for identifying in advance when there are greater or fewer risks of doing so without testing. So the way I would interpret that is, is it, can you identify early on where you, you're on safer or more risky ground with just ado adopting something uh, in a particular context? Are there warning signs? Are there ways of working out the risks in advance? In particular, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't fully hear everything. So if I'm, if, if I'm answering the wrong question, then, then you jump in and, and, and uh, stop me. But I think one of the things that is, that, that, that is really useful is to, to look at, like, do we know, for example, that an intervention has already worked in various different contexts, right? And so when I look at a chapter by, for example, Christina, and I'd mentioned it before with, with a norm and nudging, she will tell us, has something been replicated in various different contexts? If it, if it has, then at least as an organization, you, you, can, you can feel comfortable knowing, aha, there seems to be an intervention. It seems to be more, less sensitive to contextual differences, right? So if I'm applying this particular intervention in, in my setting, potentially the risk of, of backfiring is actually lower, right? So, so this is where a chapter that is written by an expert on a specific intervention or on a specific subject topic is really helpful because they can aggregate for you as a researcher in general what has worked. And then you may not choose an intervention that you know has been only applied so far in one particular setting, in one particular study and may have worked really well, but you have no idea how sensitive it is to contextual differences. Um, but I may have not answered your question, and if so, then I'm really apologizing because I did have a, an issue with the connection here on my end. Sorry about that. No, that, that's great, thank you. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I'll just echo on the, the whole notion of testing again. I mean, I, I still 
I'm just beating this drum again, but I still think it's important to verify some way. It doesn't have to be a trial. It could be a simple lab experiment. It could even be a bunch of focus groups where you expose people to two versions of the same product or, uh, the, or, or two versions of a message or whatever else, right? But before reading the LIPS papers and before blindly applying it or before blindly applying Nina's uh, results, I think it would be helpful for companies to do some minimal testing to make sure uh, that people seem to react the same way as our experimental participants did. So that's one. I think the second thing, which is not in the book and something that we are hoping to work on now is, I would love to be able to put together some sort of a rubric to help a practitioner come up with an index of how similar the context in that published paper is or the previous research is with their own, right? And you could think about elements such as is it the same domain? Are we looking at the same kind of population? Uh, is the medium used to deliver the intervention similar? Uh, and, and so we, we, we are in the process of trying to, to generate a laundry list of things that drive a definition of a situation. And maybe that sort of tool would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so we, we've got one question from Barry, one from Paul, and they seem to touch on, on similar th things in some ways. They talk about you know, the fact that we know about um, knowledge translation, that is a, uh, an area that people have looked at, and also implementation science is a known field of study. Um, do you, so is there anything that these fields can say to this, this problem that you're identifying? Uh, what, how have they approached it and can we learn from them um, to make sure we're not just reinventing the wheel by considering the, these issues? Um, Nina, I don't know if you want to take that one uh, to start with. I, again, I, sorry, I seem to be having issues. I'll, I'll yeah. jump in. Let me jump in, Nina, and then you can trail off uh, and, and hopefully the, your connection stays stable. I think the short answer is yes. I think there's a lot to be learned from implementation science in particular. Um, Knowledge translation models are interesting. I think the traditional knowledge translation model is that we in academia produce the knowledge and then there's a pipeline through which it gets disseminated and used. Um, I, I somehow think we need to update that a little bit. I think we need to think about our organizational partners as co-creators as opposed to mere consumers of knowledge. I think uh, that's, it's not, it's not, a pipeline flowing downwards. I think we have to be at, at, at equal level. Um, but, but I think we need to think very clearly about what we do as scientists and how we can do it differently, what practitioners do and how they can do it differently, but the pipeline in the middle. And I think that's one thing that we haven't really studied very well. So we've been doing some research again at the center on trying to understand how information flows through that knowledge translation pipeline. Uh, there's a voltage drop there as well. Uh, so, you know, you could produce a paper that is extremely nuanced and it talks about an effect, but by the time it actually gets through that media pipeline, uh, it becomes more simplified and it becomes, you know, it, it's just, it's portrayed as simpler than it is. And there's actually two ways in which it happens. Uh, one way is that the institutional details of the experiment get lost along the way, right? So I could write a paper that's true for men in their 40s in Canada, responding to incentives for healthy behaviors. Uh, and by the time uh, the third media report comes out, it's about everybody in the world responding to incentives, right? So we lose the, the detail, that, that's one, right? The other thing that happens is sometimes we get uh, sort of reports that uh, essentially talk about a reverse causality, right? Uh, so this happened very recently. I read a paper that, uh, that showed that People who had mental health anxieties uh, working from home felt better when they went back to a hybrid work situation, right? So conditional on the fact that they had anxieties, conditional on the fact that they went back to a hybrid work situation, they felt better. The media report says, if you want to solve your mental health anxieties, go to a hybrid format, right? So essentially they've got the wrong conditional. So, so I think those are the things I worry about. And, and I think we need to have a, better science of how we can help disseminate. Uh, part of the problem I think is academics don't have the incentive to, to be involved in those things. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll let Nina think about uh, whether she has any anything for the two add. All good. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you so Thanks, thanks so much. Um, so we have a question. Um, 
which is more high level, uh, which is on both the academic and practitioner side, does behavioral science focus too much on what works versus why it works? So in other words, are we not learning enough about mechanisms? Nina, I don't know if you heard me that time, but do you want to take yeah. that one? Thanks. Yeah, I think I, I did get it. I, I, I would agree. I think uh, the statement was that, that we are learning more about if effects and not so much about the mechanism, like why something is happening. I absolutely agree. But I mean, I think that is part of how 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 progress in, in, in science evolves. Like when we think about behavioral science, how it how it has evolved over the last few years. Um, I think it, it it was important to show that applying behavioral science in in various settings, whether it's on taxation or getting people to work out more or getting vaccinated, um, I think it it was important to 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 see whether it can make a difference and how big that that, that difference is, right? But um, I do think. As we're thinking more about what can we learn to really give prescriptions on how to better scale and to translate those insights, we need to understand more about the underlying processes, because when we understand them, I think the likelihood of success is much, much higher. So let me give you um, an example. So um, since we've talked in the beginning about the text experiments that, that you guys did in, in the UK, like one of the big uh, or one of the conditions that worked really well, as I remember, was um, social norms, right? And, 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 but we don't necessarily know why, right? But it, they worked really well. They worked really also well by when some World Bank colleagues of mine applied it in Guatemala with you guys. And then I went ahead with uh, a, a few of them with the World Bank and we applied that in Poland and it actually backfired. So it actually backfired and, and, and it's really intriguing. But again, we don't know why. And so we were actually able um, then to go back to, to Poland to, to run some surveys with some questions of what we thought, okay, well, let's find out what it is. Is it because of the historical background of the country being socialist, being communist, so that, so that maybe there is an aversion to hearing what everybody else is doing? Or, I mean, I mean the, so we had a few ideas and we went, afterwards and to try and test the mechanism and, and and I think it is important to develop more of that insights because then if I had known from the very beginning then I could have said well maybe this is not the right intervention so but I think it is an exciting time we have accumulated a lot of evidence as a field and I think now we do want to move more into the mechanism absolutely that is an, an important future or is an important development in our field and, and it is happening. This book is a great overview. Thank you so much for putting it together. Katie Milkman has appeared. I think this <laughs> means it's time for us to, to say uh, bye, but I want to thank so much um, to, to the both of you for this really great book and for explaining it so uh, massively well today. It's been, it's been great for me. I hope the audience has enjoyed it. Katie, uh, over to you. I wanted to add my thanks as well. And thank you so much, Michael, also for doing an amazing job moderating this conversation. You were the perfect person to be in that role. And it was just fascinating to hear all of your thoughts. I learned a lot and I agree with pretty much everything I heard. So thank you. And let me just close by saying that we hope you'll join us, all three of you, all, all four of you, because I see Angela's on as well, uh, and everyone in the audience for our uh, last spring behavioral science authors event, which is on Friday, May 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be speaking with Max Bazerman of Harvard Business School and Don Moore of Berkeley Haas um, School of Business, who are co-authors of the new book, Decision Leadership, which I also highly recommend. And that conversation will be led by Barry Schwartz. He's an emeritus professor at Swarthmore College and a visiting professor at Berkeley's Haas School of Business. So lots of wonderful content coming up there as well. Hope to see you all, and thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye, Thank everyone. You.